Well, a pleasant good morning to all and a cordial welcome to those who are visiting with us today. Our audience is graced with the presence of several who are visiting. It's a special week for many of us. It's uh, Thanksgiving week, and in fact, some of our own families are already gone visiting their families in other places. We're glad to have each and every one with us today. And in fact, it is a special week, and I hope that each of you indeed have a joyful week visiting perhaps with your own family, Thanksgiving Day on Thursday. In fact, uh, Greg and Koshka are in Oregon today. Greg is supposed to be preaching there, visiting Koshka's family. And since Greg is gone, it falls my opportunity to preach this morning. In fact, uh, listening to Brother Adam at the 9 o'clock hour, I was convinced that we both are thinking along the same line about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving to God. If you didn't hear his lesson at the 9 o'clock hour, you need to listen to it when later in the week it will be put on our website. Indeed, as I was thinking about the lesson today, I, I titled it a little differently. I call the lesson today a sin that is often overlooked. And the reason I titled it as something often overlooked is because I'm convinced that if you had a sheet of paper and I were to ask you this morning to make a list of ten sins, you probably would not list this one. Oh, you may, you may list several of the Ten Commandments, or maybe even something that's not one of the ten, but probably you would not have listed the sin of ingratitude. How many of us even think of failure to give thanks as a sin? Now, there are many today who gather probably this week and <clears throat> around the dinner table, and they may give thanks for a lot of different things but I'm sure there'd be some people even in our nation that has been so richly blessed by God, and yet there are some who would not really include God in their thanksgiving. And yet the Bible speaks about sin as, as a sin because it is listed with several evil companions. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, where the apostle there speaks how that, in, in, he said, know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. And then notice as he lists it. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. And then there's this word, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form, of un, a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Now some of these things even in this list you might have put. Proud, where it says lovers of money, the King James Version says covetous, and probably we would have thought of that one maybe. But how many would have, of us would have listed the word unthankful as a people who really are not giving God the kind of thank that, uh, thanksgiving that they ought to give. Indeed, it is a sin because it does not honor God. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul addressing the, the brethren at Rome set, sets forth the theme of this epistle in Romans 1 16 when he says, The gospel is God's power unto salvation to everyone who believes. And then the very next verse speaks about his wrath being stirred up. Now, those who think of God as only a God of love and a God of mercy, and they do not want to think of God as, as having anger or wrath, or, or, nor do they want to think about the consequences of not obeying the gospel. And some might say, well, why would God be filled with wrath against people? And the scripture follows that by saying how that the wrath of God is, is against those who who do ungodliness and who are unrighteous, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and then he answers the why. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, its invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What he's saying is here are people who have no reason to fail to understand who God is or to believe in God. There are those who say, oh, I believe in God, but they're unwilling to obey the gospel. 
and the wrath of God is thereby stirred up against them. But notice the argument. Even from God Himself, by the creation of the world, the things that are made are an argument that God exists. And it is by His might and power that the world as we know it is from the hand of God. And then He adds, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Neither were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Oh, there are those in our nation even who have every reason to understand who God is, who may have known God at one time, yet who do not glorify him as God. They have not obeyed the gospel. They do not praise him as God. And like the Gentiles of the past who refused God, though they knew Him, the Scripture says, yet what happened to them, failing to give thanks unto God and to glorify Him as God? God's wrath is against them, our loving God. Oh, indeed, their reason to believe in God. I know today we have people who like to say, well, you know, I'm just not sure I can believe in God. Or even some claim, I'm an atheist. It's becoming more and more popular. I'm willing to tell you the scriptures say that, that there's every reason for you to know God and to believe in God. And the fact that you do not believe in God, God's wrath is stirred against you. And the reason why, without all the arguments, there are some who don't even think about the arguments so much. It's just kind of a, I think I, I, some have found it to be a way of excusing themselves from accountability. You see, if I claim I believe in God, then I need to obey the God. But if I just say, well, I'm not sure I believe in God, then that kind of relieves me. As though, if God is really what the Bible says He is, it's going to be all right for me. Not true. You have every reason to believe in God. And the world, even the heavens, declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork, is what it's saying. Some years ago, our family here in the congregation may remember when Brother Phil Robertson was preaching over at Melbourne, and at the same time was working for the ABC affiliate. He had the responsibility over uh, at, at the... Uh, at NASA, and of course was a reporter for the, you might say, the east coast of Florida. Back in February of 2003, you may remember when the spaceship Columbia was coming back in, it was to land on the Saturday morning. It just so happened that weekend, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday, we had Brother D. Bowman preaching for us in a special weekend series. On that Friday night, Brother Phil came to the services, and he invited Brother D and our wives to come over the next morning on Saturday. He's going to give us a special place to watch this spaceship land. Well, we would have gone, except we had already accepted an invitation for that Saturday morning, and we're not able to go. But we got the television on, more probably to see how Brother Phil did than the spaceship itself. I've never forgotten that morning when that spaceship didn't land but the spotlight was on Phil when he said, it's eight seconds late. Something's wrong. Eight seconds? Some of us aren't concerned if we're eight minutes late. Eight seconds late? How could he say that? Because there's such precision and such order to our universe. There is reason to believe in God. And even, as he says, since or by the creation of the world, there's evidence that God is. And those who are unthankful to God, <clears throat> who fail to honor God, commit sin in and of itself. Indeed, we ought to have an attitude to give things always. If you have your Bible open with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, it shows an attitude that we all ought to have toward life itself and toward our presence in, before God. The text of 1 Chronicles 29 is when David had gathered together the materials for which the temple would be built by Solomon. And there were precious jewels, gold and silver, and, and the wood that would be used in the building of this beautiful temple to the Lord. You might think at this point David could sort of throw out his chest and say, Lord, aren't you proud of us? Look what we've done. But I want you to read the prayer. It's not at all of that attitude. I'm reading 1 Chronicles 29, beginning in verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. 
In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. You notice the attitude? It isn't David saying, Now, Lord, look what we've gathered. Aren't you glad that we've done this for you to build this? Not that spirit, was it? In fact, what he says is, All things really came of you. But what we've prepared here is yours to start with. We're simply giving back to you what is yours. I know the collection plate was passed this morning. How many of us thought that way as you prepared, maybe earlier, even a check or whatever cash? Whatever you give to God, do you ever think of it that way? But really, Lord, this is yours, and what I'm giving is really back to you because you've provided it for us. It's that attitude of thanksgiving that David indeed had and that we also ought to have, that all things flow, first of all, from God, in fact. And passages like in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 and 18, where there the Apostle Paul says, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Wait a minute, in everything? Isn't that a bit overdoing it? In everything, give thanks? I've preached in congregations, maybe where in other places I'll say, I, I know there's some people when they come out the door on Sunday morning, I do not ask them, how are you today? And the reason is, I know some people always say, well, if you ask that question, you say, you know, I'm doing pretty good, but this pain, you know, or I went to the doctor, or if always talking about the negative. I found with some of those, it's best if I were to just simply say, man, you look nice today. Sure it's good to see you. And you give them a positive, they don't know how to answer that one hardly. But, you know, it's easy for us to get in a negative mood and to always talk about the, the bad. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20, the statement here says, giving things always, notice, for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that really sounds like it's overdoing, isn't, isn't it? Wait a minute. Aren't there some bad things in our life that happen? Some months ago I was in another place and I was sad to learn that one of the families had a son who was enrolled in university and he'd been home visiting on his way back to school. A drunk came across his lane, head-on collision, and their son was killed. Now do you say, Lord, we are so thankful for this wreck and our son was killed? No, even the Bible spoke about how it is right to sorrow. Jesus sorrowed. And we may sorrow, but listen, not as others who have no hope. Here's the key. Life has changed when we get the perspective of putting God first in our life, of recognizing that indeed all things flow from Him, and we one day shall return unto Him. We know not how long life is. It's not made successful because you've lived to be, as my father, 104 years old. That, that doesn't make life successful. You may die at 18 and still be successful as this young lad did. You know what they could give thanks for? They could give thanks that their son was a Christian. They could give thanks that through Jesus Christ there was hope of life everlasting. We live in this world not just for the passing moments and the, the temporal blessings that we share. But when we get the perspective that we are living, preparing for a realm that is eternal in its nature. I think of the passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, when the Apostle Peter wrote about people who were being sorely persecuted. He said, first of all, in verse 3, Blessed be the God of our Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again, to a living hope, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ the, the, uh, from the dead. Notice he says, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed on the last time. I want you to notice verse 6 when it says, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a season or a little while, if need be, you have been grieved 
by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, you love, though you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You notice that? You re- with joy inexpressible. That means you can't put it into words. It is something you say better felt than told. That's really what Peter's saying. What's he talking about? He's talking to people who are in heaviness of the persecution, the trials that are being brought on them at a time when Nero was emperor of Rome. And indeed, there were many Christians who suffered during that time. God did not promise heaven on earth. God did not promise that around us would be a wall built and there will be no problems if you're a Christian. Everything's going to be... Pre- he didn't promise that. He did not promise happiness in every situation. I don't know what he did promise. You have reason to rejoice. To rejoice in words or that which is joy inexpressible because of the hope that you have in the world yet to come. From the perspective... When one really understands who God is and has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice by God's grace and through His mercy, that makes the perspective of life change. It doesn't matter what other situations we may face. And the reality is we all face bad situations. As in Job 14 and verse 1, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And I'm certain I, to every adult in this auditorium even this morning. I want to say, is there some trouble on your heart? You all, every one of us could say yes, and you could name something. It may be you've just been to the doctor and there's maybe some sickness, maybe cancer. Or maybe there's been a loved one who's just passed away, maybe even unexpectedly. Or you may have a financial burden, or you've just lost a job, or there are different things, but all of us are affected with things that Yes, we wished maybe they didn't occur. Promise is, in the world yet to come, they will not occur. In the world yet to come, we live for that. And we must keep our eyes set on who we are, the children of God, and where we are going, heaven. When you lose sight of that, you may as well, or you will have, pulled up your anchor, the anchor being hope. If you pull up your anchor, indeed life becomes a miserable situation then it's easy for us always to gripe and complain. On the other hand, when we know that God indeed is the one in charge and we're going to give him thanks for he's promised to bless, then we need to understand how is it possible that we overcome ingratitude. If ingratitude is maybe a problem with us, if we fail maybe in our own lives to really see life from a perspective that God is completely in charge, how do we overcome that attitude of ingratitude, unthankful. Yeah, there are some people who are unthankful because they choose to be. They choose to ignore God and not obey Him. Think and thank come from the same root words. And there are those who may not just be against God, but they haven't thought about God. And so they're unthankful because they're not thinking what they ought to think. Actually, I want to list about four different things for you this morning and say, let's get our thinking right. Indeed, if we're going to overcome ingratitude, we need, first of all, from a positive point of view, to count our blessings, not our bruises. Bruises? Yes, we have bruises. But too many of us, maybe like picking a rose, we we get the thorns rather than the beautiful flower. And and we count the, we, we talk about the things that are the negatives, you know, well, uh, everything is dated maybe from some negative event in our life. You remember back, uh, well, it's before that hurricane. You remember when Charlie came through? And before Charlie, we did this and that. Or after Charlie, we were, my house was destroyed maybe by Charlie or whatever. Or, you know, before I had that car wreck, and ever since then, we have a before and after type of thing. And usually the, the thing we want to measure by is something that maybe was a negative I know our songbooks that we use here, perhaps you are aware that one of the editors was Brother R.J. Stevens. Brother R.J.'s great friend did a, did a great deal of work 
of value to the Christians with putting together this songbook. He had a younger brother, and uh, Lanier was his name. It just so happened when Arlene and I had just married and were in university finishing school back in Nacogdoches at Stephen F. Austin, Lanier, R.J.'s younger brother, came to school at the same time. We were great friends. But Lanier had had an accident in high school with a lawnmower and cut his big toe. And it was very common for Lanier to stop and say, you know, before my toe was cut, such and such and such and that. Right? Or after my toe was cut, such and such. And he did it so much, we got to where we kidded him. That Lanier had a BT and an AT. Before toe, after toe. You know? <laughs> well, it's easy for us to do it that way. Times, in fact, if we're not uh, careful, we will just take commonplace things for granted. I have a recipe here I want you women to stop and especially think about. What if this is your schedule for tomorrow? It's a recipe I found in Colorado Interstate Magazine some time ago and from someone who really did this. And I would think you could say, well, my grandparents, great-grandparents, not many years ago, this was what Monday was like. Authentic Kentucky recipe, build a fire in the backyard to heat the kettle of rainwater. Got to do Monday washing, don't we? Set the tub so the smoke won't blow in your eyes if the wind is perk. Now, she may not spell like you do today, but you understand what she meant. Shave one whole cake, soap, and boiling water. Sort of things. Make three piles. One pile white, one pile colored, one, work, one pile work, breeches, and rags. Stir the flour in the cold water to smooth, then thin down with boiling water. Rub the dirtiest spots on the board. Scrub hard, then boil. Rub colored, but don't boil. Just rinse and starch. Spread the tea towels on the grass. Hang the old rags on the fence. Pour the wrench water in the flower bed. Scrub the porch with the hot soapy water. Turn the tubs upside down. Go put on a clean dress. And smooth your hair with side combs. Brew a cup of tea. Set and rest a spell and count your blessings. Now that last part, would you really do that? If you do washing at all tomorrow, you put it in an automatic washing machine and close the lid and turn the dial, maybe push a button or whatever. Go your way, don't you? What if this is for your day? Do we sometimes take for granted even the small things of life that we have and enjoy? Indeed, we ought to learn how to count our blessings. There's something you can look around for and certainly be thankful for rather than emphasizing the negatives. Number two, accept your troubles without complaining. Troubles, yes. I do not mean by this lesson that we go around with a false smile on our face and we act like everything's all right when really it's not. There may be times of sorrow, but not as others who have no hope. There are realities in life, and there are things where maybe we wished it hadn't happened this way, these things were not the set of circumstances, but how our attitude and frame of mind in approaching them will affect a great deal of how indeed we're able to deal with them. In fact, uh, we may be like uh, the little boy who said he was thankful for his glasses because they kept the boys from fighting him and the girls from kissing him. <laughs> and yeah, there are times, you know, you stop and say, wait, wait, you know, I wish I didn't wear glasses, but there are some advantages for it. The fact is, even troubles in life, from James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the inspired writer spoke about counting it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You ever thought about trials in life? That they are a test, sometimes a test to our faith. There's sometimes people will say, well, how can a good God let this happen to me? And all they do is gripe about God. It is true that when troubles come, maybe severe troubles in your life, it's a test. Either you're going to turn closer to God, who promised to help us no matter what, who's promised that we'll not be overtaken by anything that we're not able to bear. But where would the temptation provide a way of escape? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Either we turn to Him and draw closer, or we can turn away and blame God. How can a good God let this happen? And there are some people who become critical of God. 
I say, why are you critical of God? It's the devil that brings the trouble in life. Why don't you blame the devil for the troubles and trials? But instead, we want to blame God for it rather than looking to God for the strength to enable us to overcome and to come through. Trials can be to our value. And that's what the writer is saying here, that indeed, the testing of your faith produces patience, forbearance. Indeed, letting that patience have perfect work, you may be perfect and complete. I think of the passage, and I love the passage in Romans 8. Probably many of us have memorized verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. That's probably been misapplied. Some have applied it as though it doesn't matter what, it's going to be like heaven on earth and everything. That's not really what that verse says. That's what it's sometimes applied. But I think it's better when we go back into the context. In Romans 8, in verse 18, the Apostle Paul is writing. And hear him when he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you know anything about the sufferings that Paul endured? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he speaks about how he was beaten with rods three times. He, he was beaten five times, I believe it is, with 40 stripes save one from the Jews. He was in shipwreck often, hungering, in weariness. And yet in all of that, he could say the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared to the glory. Now you've got to see what he's saying. He's got his focus on who he is and where he's going. And therefore, he could say these sufferings aren't even worthy to be compared to that. In fact, in verse 23, he says, Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. What was he looking forward to? He wasn't looking forward to heaven on earth. He was saying, there's something I'm living for. And that goal in mind. And with that in mind, he could say in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. The fact is that those who love God recognize that he's going to help us attain that eternal glory. He will help those who are seeking and working and living for him. And I hope that is true of everybody in this audience. That indeed all things will work together for good. Ultimately, therefore, we ought to always give thanks for everything. When we count our blessings, not our bruises, even accepting our troubles without complaining. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is the passage where the apostle writes about the children of Israel, how that because of their murmuring and complaining, you know the story of the Old Testament. They perished within the wilderness wanderings. Only the children entered into the promised land. But in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 10, there the apostle there either says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them murmured, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Don't get in the habit of being a murmurer. But a third thing that we need to learn if we're going to overcome ingratitude is to acknowledge what we have and would not trade. Now, wait a minute. Let's see where we go with that. Do you have anything that you wouldn't trade? Well... There's probably a lot of things you would not trade with people who live in China or people who live in India or people who live in the Philippines or in parts of Africa. You may not like your house, but you wouldn't want to trade with people in those places where maybe the house is about the size of your tool shed out in the back. You wouldn't want to trade what you have in your cupboard maybe a small bag of flour or some beans or sugar and salt or molded potatoes for that matter. You, you wouldn't want to trade what you have in yours. You, you wouldn't want to trade even the bathroom that you have. You flipped on a light and the light came on this morning. You probably turned the faucet and hot water came out in time. And, and you wouldn't want to trade where you have to maybe go down to the creek and get a pail of water and bring it back up. Your grandparents lived that way. Would you want to go back to the good old days? There are a lot of things that we have conveniences in this life that we, we, we may take for granted when we shouldn't take for granted. Indeed, 
what a blessing we have, and we would not trade. Maybe we ought to be like <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, elderly man that the tax assessor came one day, and he said, I, I hear that you're a rich man. And the elderly Christian said, yes, I am. He said, well, your taxes don't show it, and I've come here to examine. What is it that you have? That you? And the man started off, he said, well, the tax assessor got his pen out, and he got ready to write. And he said, well, I guess I'm rich, first of all, because I have forgiveness of sins. Mm. You know, in Acts 2.38, the promise to those on the day of Pentecost, when they asked, what shall we do, was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, he, he couldn't write that down. What else do you have? He said, well, I, I have a mansion. Oh, you have a mansion. Yeah, yeah, he's really right there. He said, you know, it's in John chapter 14 where Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. He didn't write that down any. He said, in fact, I have many houses. Oh, many houses? Yeah. You know, Jesus promised in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, that if you leave all that you have and follow me, you'll have a hundredfold of mothers and brothers and sisters and houses and lands, a hundredfold, and in the world to come, eternal life. He says, now, I may not have the deed to every one of those places, but I can assure you as a faithful Christian, indeed, I have places I can go. You may be stranded. Let's say you, you make a trip to California or wherever, and you get stranded. And for whatever reason, you're without money. Maybe somebody robbed you or whatever. I'll tell you what, you go to, maybe you look up some Christian there, follow the preacher there, or elders, you know, it's easy to find the phone book anymore. And he calls out here and says, Bob, do you know so-and-so? And I said, yeah, he or she's a faithful Christian here at the South Miami Church. Well, I just want to check, make sure we'll take care of him or her. You'd be surprised how many houses you have. And reverse that. If someone comes in here and I say, you know, here's somebody, and, and they're really a faithful Christian, would you put them up tonight? Yeah, I'll put them up tonight. You would, wouldn't you? You have many houses, you have many brethren and sisters that you'd, you may not call by name, but one day we hope around the throne of God we'll all stand and be there together. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You're wealthy. Acknowledge what you have. Well, by that time, <laughs> you know the tax assessor took his pen and said, I guess I, I really can't assess any more taxes on what you have. You are rich, all right. Are you rich? Maybe it ought to be that we're able to overcome ingratitude because of our gifts. Gifts instead of coveting more. Let me say first of all gifts that are spiritual in their nature. In our songbook, if you were to look, say the first hundred songs probably mostly, you'll find them in a section. And if you look through there, you'll find songs written by Fanny J. Crosby. That's a story that's always fascinated me and encouraged me. Fanny J. Crosby lived in the late 1800s. And there were several songs that she wrote that we still sing today. Songs like, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. He hideth my soul, though your sins be as scarlet, close to thee. Praise Him, praise Him that we were singing earlier today. To God be the glory, near the cross, and on and on. Now those are all songs that make us give praise unto God. Do you know these were written by a woman who was blind? She didn't have to be blind. She was not born blind. But as an infant, she had some kind of infection in her eyes, and of course back at that point in time, they didn't have the specialist that we have. And even the, the regular doctor was out of the area at the time, and there was a quack who proceeded to say he, could, he, he thought he could heal or help that infection. And the story is that he prepared some kind of poultice, put on her eye, and it caused her to be blind. Now, 
blind people today have many helps in their blindness, but back in that time they didn't. They said they chased that quack out of town. Fanny J. Crosby could have grown up and all of her life said, you know, poor me, poor me, poor me. Didn't have to be blind. How did they let that, how did God let that happen? How could that, you know, you could think of the many things she could have said. But instead, what she writes are songs of thanksgiving to God because she had faith in what is yet to come. In fact, in the song, He Hided My Soul, it's our number 363, in which one of the lines says, with numberless blessings each moment he crowns. Numberless blessings. Do you feel like God has blessed you with numberless blessings? Indeed, we ought to learn a lesson from some people who indeed have suffered more than we have, and yet thank God for it. But remembering our gifts not only in a spiritual way, but even in a material way. How many times do we really understand passages like 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 8, where the apostle says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, it's certain we can carry nothing out, but having food and raiment. Let us therewith be content. Let us be without covetousness. Let us have the spirit and the attitude of one who looks to God, the giver of every good and perfect gift. Be not like the rich food in Luke chapter 12, where the scripture said his ground brought forth plentifully. And all he could think of is, well, what shall I do? I'll just build bigger barns and there I'll store my, store my goods. And I'll say to my soul, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But Jesus said, he died that night. Then what will he do with those things he left behind? He was a fool, wasn't he? Remember who you are and where you're going. Give thanks to God always for all things. Remember that he loves you and will bless you. And no matter what your trial may be, he'll help you get through it. But more than anything, you give him the praise. Remembering the perspective that even whatever comes my way, indeed heaven's my home. I've lived for that. May God bless us so that we all spend eternity in heaven. Perhaps there's one here this morning who's not ready for heaven. Maybe you say, I've believed in God, I've, I understand, but someday later is all you can say, I'll obey. It may be too late. You may already have destined yourself to hell because of a rejection of God. Instead of thinking it gets easier as you go along to believe, it, it sometimes gets much harder. Don't put off. That's all the devil wants you to do is put off. Wait till later. Today is the day of salvation. We're going to sing a song. We call it an invitation song, giving you an opportunity to respond to the Lord in obedience. If you need anything we can do to help you get your soul right for heaven, maybe as a Christian, we can pray for you if you need that. Or even as one who's never really become a Christian because you've never really obeyed the gospel. Why not confessing your faith, Jesus, as the Son of God, repenting of your sins, be immersed, baptized, even this hour. Won't you come? All together we stand while we sing.